for the meeting tonight. Thank you for the training. Thank you for the impact these meetings are having on everyone's life. We ask, O oh Lord, we will not be hearers only, but doers of the word in Jesus' name. I will pray that you enlighten us once again today. Strengthen us to do your work and to do it acceptably as well as faithfully in Jesus' name. We pray that you reward everyone of their faithful service. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Another good amen. God bless you. Can see now we're looking in Proverbs chapter 4. In Proverbs chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 20. Proverbs chapter 4, reading from verse 20. It says, My son, attend to my words, incline thine ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart. Why? Look at verse 22. For they are life unto those that find them, and health to all their flesh. Many times as we learn the word of God, hear the word of God, receive the word of God, we do not know the impact of that word, the effect of that word, the power of that word, the result of that word in our lives. Here it tells us that when we receive the word of God in our heart and we believe it, and we stand on it. And we trust the Lord of the word. And we're holding on to the word of the Lord. Very precious. It says the result is, as we find it, it will be health to all our flesh. Tonight I'm talking on something that you might not relate with health. But I'm talking on health tonight. Healing life-threatening diseases in the body. Healing life-threatening diseases in the body. As I talk about the body, you want to understand, the New Testament in particular presents the body to us in two ways. One, your own personal body, your flesh. And in that place it says, it will be health, the word of God will be health to all your flesh. Which means health to your body, every part of your body. But then, there's another sense in which the body is used. Especially when you come to the New Testament. It means the church, the body of Christ. It means the flock. It means the fold of Christ. It means the assembly of called out people. So as I talk about the body tonight, I'll be coming from the area of your own personal body. How do you get healthy? How do you remain healthy? So that life-threatening diseases do not waste your life or cost your life short. But on the other hand, I'm talking about the body of Christ. How does the body of Christ keep healthy? and strong and sound by the word of the Lord. So we understand what to comprehend tonight and perceive the body in these two distinct ways, the body of each individual and the body of Christ, the church. As the body of each of us, as each Christian, we can be healed, not only healed, we can be healthy. You see, there are many people, they're looking for healing. They get sick, they get healed, they get sick, they get healed. But the will of God for you as an individual is that in your body, in your flesh, in your mind, in your brain, in your eyesight, in your ears, in your kidney, in every part of you, you'll not only be getting sick and getting healed, you'll be healthy. Amen. And you're going to be healthy in Jesus' name. Amen. See those apostles who are read about they couldn't do the work they did. It will not sound unhealthy. You find Paul, the apostle, running here and going there. He had to be healthy. And you find Peter, the apostle, 
from chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4 today. If you ask me, if you ask us how this man is made whole, standing before you here, is by the face of the Lord Jesus Christ, he stands here before you. And the man was so courageous and bold, he wasn't vacillating. Even before those people, the mind was healthy. The brain was healthy. And his heart was healthy. He wasn't depressed. He wasn't in despair. He wasn't in any disease. He was strong in body and mind. And you can be. And you will be. And then you remain strong and sound. It's when you are strong and sound like that, you'll be able to confront any issue and any situation that comes against you. But now on the other hand, the body of Christ, the church, can be healthy. Our church will be healthy. Can be sound, can be pure, can be passionate, can be preserved, sanctified, and strengthened. If we desire to be healed and healthy, we must know how Christ who heals our individual bodies must that he also desires that his body, the church, be healthy and whole, every weight whole. You know, it will be like thoughtless. If we want to be healthy, I want to be healthy, I want to be strong, and yet I'm doing things that will make the body of Christ unhealthy. He is to heal me. And I want to use that healing and health and soundness and strength. I want to use that to weaken his own body. It's like a doctor is treating you. He wants you to be well. He wants you to be sound. He wants you to be healthy. And he's doing everything to serve you and to make you whole. And on the other hand, you're doing something to enjoy his own body. And you're doing something to weaken his own body. You're doing something to make his own body sick while he's trying to help you to be strong and healthy. That will not be reasonable. He's not going to continue to do that. If he finds that while he's lifting you up, you're bringing him down to bury him. And so Christ, our healer, Christ, our redeemer, and Christ who wants us to be healed and healthy, and sound and strong he wants us to also know that he desires just like you desire that his own body will be strong his own body will be healthy and those two things working together i believe you'll be healthy Amen. you'll be sound Amen. and then your help the body of christ will be healthy and strong and sound in jesus name Amen. talking about the body of christ come to ephesians chapter 5 Ephesians chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 15. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15. See then that she walks circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. It says as we go through life, we're looking at our time. And we're redeeming the time. We know that we have a short time. The Lord is about to come. And he says this gospel of the kingdom must be preached the whole world for a witness. And then the end will come. And so we are running for time. And we want to do everything we can do so that we'll evangelize our communities as we have the time so short. In verse 17 it says, Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. It says every moment and every time. It says every day and every week. We should be wise, understanding what's the will of God. That means in every area of our lives, as we're living our lives, I want to find out, I want to find out what's the will of God for me today. As the day is unequal to a close today, what can I still do? What must I still do to be in the center of the will of God? And it says, be not drunk with wine. Be not drunk with wine. There are some people that are intoxicated. They're intoxicated with some ideas, some principles, some ideologies, and some practices. And it's like, you know, that thing gets into your head. They cannot think about why am I alive? Where am I going? What have I done? 
What am I still to do? How can I make my way rewardable, pleasant in the sight of the Lord? They're so intoxicated with some non-essentials, superficial things, irrelevant things, and matters in life that do not make any, any difference in their own lives or in the life of anyone. They're so intoxicated with that, they cannot think of their future. And it says, be not drunk with wine, when in is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. What does that mean? Be controlled by the Spirit. Be energized by the Spirit. Be driven by the Spirit. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing and making melody in your heart. Tell me the rest there. I can't hear you. To the Lord. And that's talking about everybody. Not only our choir, not only our singers, but even our choir. How many times do we think, filing up and coming to the state to think, I'm going to make melody unto the Lord. Do you ever think about that if you're a member of the choir? Or do you just say, this is part of the program of the church. Here am I today. If I'm happy, I'm going to sing well. If I'm not happy, I'm not going to sing well and make it so lousy that I even want the pastor, the coordinator to call me. I want the group pastor to call me that, why did you sing like that? Why did you sing like that? And if they don't call you to, and they just leave you and they say, okay, Ephraim is, uh, you know, gone his own way. Let him alone. You're even disappointed they are not angry. You are disappointed. They are not uh, calling you to say, why did you sing like that? But you know, when you find out like that, you want to sing, you want to present whatever you have to the Lord, it says you are making melody in your heart unto the Lord. I pray we'll learn our lesson. Amen. I can't hear your amen. amen. It says giving thanks. Always, always giving thanks. You know, there are some people Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. They don't understand that every time we need to be giving thanks unto God and unto the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then it says, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Submitting yourselves in the fear of God. You see, as we relate together in the church, members of the body of Christ, and we will submit ourselves, yes, to the Lord, but then to one another one another. The fellow that feels I can do whatever I want to do, I'm independent, I'm indifferent to whatever anybody, anybody desires, I'm just a man of my own heart. You are a member of the body and as a member of the body, if you do not submit, if your hand does not submit to your brain, if your legs, your feet do not submit to your brain, if your eyes do not submit to your brain, and if other parts of the body do not submit to your brain, the body cannot function well. And it's the same thing with the body of Christ. If we do not submit to one another, and then sometimes, you know, want to, both of us want to pass through a narrow door, and then I step back and I say, after you, brother, after you, sister if we cannot do that you want to have your way i want to have my way the body is not going to function well like that and it's going to be healthy it's not going to be sound it's not going to be strong that's why it says in verse 21 submitting yourselves to one another in the fear of god and now it says wives submit yourselves unto tell me out aloud sisters tell me out aloud sisters your own husband as to the Lord. You know, sometimes I find, uh, you know, some of these uh, beautiful, wonderful sisters, once they are submissive to their local pastor, they say, that's all. And the husband now says, uh, my dear, do this. Uh -uh. I'm submitting already to the pastor. And because I'm submitting already to, you know, my local pastor, I don't need to submit to my own husband. But look at this. It says, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husband. Underline the word own. Your husband must have the confidence that you're obedient at home. You're humble enough. 
You are submissive enough to him as your husband. And then he says, as unto the Lord. If you're a real Christian, you're not, you know, sometimes I submit to the Lord. Sometimes I don't submit to the Lord. You don't do that. You don't say, in major things, I submit to the Lord. In minor things, I think I'll just have my own way. It says you submit to your own husbands. Sisters, tell me. I've lost my crowd. As unto the Lord, that will change our attitude. Look at verse 23. For the husband is the food of the wife. For the husband is the... Okay, I thought it said, is the cleaning uh, rag of the wife. So that, you know, the wife is always having her way. And then the husband, you know, whatever you give me, I'm all right. Because how can I complain? Because if I complain, you know, things are going to get worse. No, not at all. In a Christian family, to keep a Christian family healthy and strong, this must be there. The word of God must be there. It says, for the husband is the head of the wife. Even as Christ is the head of the church. And he is the savior. This is where we're going of the body. Christ is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be subject to their, tell me, own husbands in a few things in religious things, in doctrinal matters, in walking in the church, in everything. That's the word of God. And if we claim to be members of um, a Bible-believing church, there it is there that we submit to our husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. Thank God, husbands, are we there today? I said, are we there today? Yes. You know, there are husbands, and because we are pastors, I'm a pastor, am I not? How many of you are like pastors like me? Okay, if you are a pastor like me, we have a lot of work we are doing. I'm reading the Bible, I'm studying the Bible, I'm preparing the message, I'm, you know, counseling people, I'm praying for people. And when people are sick, I need to touch their lives. And when there are problems, I have to, you know, show interest. And I'm so busy as a pastor that I take care of outsiders more than I take care of my wife. He says no, he says no. Although Jesus Christ ministered to people outside the church and helped those who are outside the church, those who are inside the body, the body of Christ, he helped them more, he sacrificed for them more. And if you look at the way you spend your time, no time to discuss with your wife, no time to interact with your wife, no time to see her when she is maybe unhappy or when she's sick or whatever, because I'm busy, I'm busy, I'm busy. I'm from this meeting going to that other meeting. It says reorganize, rearrange, rearrange your time. It says husbands, love your wives. Tell me the next word. Even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself, some people will not even give money, and gave himself, some will not even give attention, and gave himself, some will not even give, you know, whatever it takes for the house to keep running, and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. And that he might present each the church unto himself, a glorious church, is the husband that is to make the wife presentable to the public. Not that, you know, the husband is well-dressed and looking very good, and yet the wife is like, you know, a, a kind of mage in that family. It says uh, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love, tell me now, their wives as their own bodies. You see the body there, your individual body. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, even as the Lord the church. For we are, look at this now, for we are members, tell me, 
of his body, this is the body of Christ now, he says of his flesh and of his bones, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto how many wives? I said how many wives? Only one unto his wife, and did you, husband one and uh, wife second, did you, the male, the female, did you, the man, the woman, did you, the bridegroom, the bride, did you, shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, even as himself, even as himself. And the wife see that she, what's the word there? Now, the, the apostle could have used the word respect, and that should, that should be all right. That should be legitimate. He could have said so, urge the wife to respect the husband. But in the sense of, uh, you know, understanding scripture, respect is too ordinary. Respect is too superficial. Respect is too empty. Respect is too secular. And if we're going to have a real Christian family, healthy family, sound family, strong family, scriptural family, that the wife should, what's the word? Reverence the husband. Reverence the husband. And so the Lord is telling us that we can be a strong body and we can be a healthy body and we must and we're going to be in Jesus' name. Again, tonight I'm talking on healing life-threatening diseases in the body. Three points. Number one, the prevention of plagues and a sickly body. The prevention of plagues and a sickly body. We don't have to be sick and we don't have to be sickly. We don't have to be weak. We don't have to be anemic. We don't have to be almost blind as we're getting older or we're totally deaf as we're getting older. We can be strong. We can be healthy. And I pray that tonight, God will change everything changeable in your body, your flesh, in Jesus' name. What if, uh, you know, God will give you another 15 years? You understand another 15 years? That means he'll roll back the hands of the clock. You'll be as strong today as you were 15 years ago. Who wants that? I want it. I said I want it. You will get it tonight. Yeah. I didn't just say you can, you must. Yeah. You must be stronger today. Yeah. You must be healthier today. Yeah. And every life threatening disease in your life should be cancelled tonight in Jesus' name. Yeah. The prevention of plagues and a sickly body. Point number two the prescription. The prescription for for preservation from a sick body. The prevention, or the, sorry, the prescription for preservation from a sick body. Number three, the priority and pursuit of a sound body. That point number three divides into two branches. By, uh, branch one, the priority and the pursuit of a sound body, little b, that's your own body. And then the second branch, the priority and pursuit of a sound body, that's capital B, the body of Christ. Both are going to be strong. Now we're coming to uh, the prevention of plagues and a sickly body. We're coming to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. First Corinthians chapter 12, I read from verse 13. First Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. 
For by one spirit we all baptized into one body. Obviously that's talking about the body of Christ. It says we're all baptized. You repent, you believe, you're baptized in water. And you're baptized into the body of Christ. And it says whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be born or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. It says for the body is not one member but many. That is we have many members. There are men, there are women, there are boys. They're girls, they're born again, they're children of God, and he says, We're well, many, and yet we're one body. And he goes on to say, If the foot shall say, Because I'm not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? He says, uh, The reason why plagues uh, come into the body of Christ, and the reason why it appears that the body of Christ is not strong and not firm and not, not strengthened to do what we need to do, is because. I'm saying, I don't have anything to do with him. I don't have anything to do with her. I'm by myself. I'm just the foot, and therefore I'm not totally part of the body. That segregation, that separation, that disunity, that discord, that disunity is going to bring a plague in the church, weakness in the church. Look at it in verse 16. If the ear shall say, because I'm not the eye, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? It's saying that another member is saying, well, I'm not as important. They don't look my direction. They will not appoint me for this. They will not choose me for that. And saying, say, oh, okay, I understand. I understand. I'm not from this tribe. I'm not from that tribe. If you're thinking like that, you're going to make the church of the living God weak and sick, even sickly. It goes on in verse 17. If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole body were hearing, where were the smelling? It says if we're all having the same assignment, everybody must be, you know, this particular area of ministry, everybody must be this, and then each one is catering and uh, cherishing their own section. You know, the choir people say, we are the choir, and whatever is happening in the evangelism, we don't have any interest, but this is our area. It says it's going to make the church sick. If the ushers of the secret chief, they say, this is my area, evangelism, forget about that. This is what I am committed to. If the women's section will say, this is what we are, and this is the only thing we are going to do, any other thing we are not interested if uh, the men, the youth are saying this is the only thing we have, and we're not going to be interested in any other thing, if the other areas of the church collapse, that's okay for them, that's okay for them. We refer to the rest of the church as them. We never use the word us. It says we don't understand the body. If the whole body were just this ministry or that ministry, what do you have the whole body? Verse 18, but now as God said members, every one of them in the body, as it has pleased you, as it has pleased him. Let God be God. I said, let God be God. Complaints, murmuring, throwing stones, tearing things apart. They didn't look my direction. They didn't think about me. They didn't understand. I want to be this. I want to be that. God has placed in the church members, ministers, as it has pleased him. And in verse 19, and if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they many members, yet but one body? And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of thee. We have need of each other. I said we have need of each other. You think you only need the preacher, but we need everybody. You think you only need to stop this ministry, that ministry, but we need everybody. And we are to complement each other, support each other, lift up each other, encourage each other, and make the ministry of the other person very important in your own sight and in their own sight, 
as they encourage you, you are encouraging them. Look at uh, chapter 11, verse 29. Verse, verse 29, chapter 11. It says, For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, he that and drinketh a mission to himself. Look at this. Not discerning the Lord's body. You know, sometimes you don't want to uh, take the uh, Lord's Supper. See, now this Sunday we are going to take the Lord's Supper. Really, we shouldn't even be announcing. It's for the body of Christ. And if you are part of the body, you come to church every Sunday. And if you are there that Sunday, we just uh, decide that this Sunday we are going to take the Lord's Supper. We don't need any special preparation. When the rapture is going to take place, there's not going to be any special preparation. The trumpet will sound. The dead in Christ shall rise, and we which are alive shall be caught up together with them. They're not, it's not going to make any announcement. Get ready, get ready. The rapture is coming. Get ready, be prepared. You are prepared every time. If you are not prepared for the rapture every time, the Lord's Supper. But that's, that's a minor thing. And so, if you're going to take the Lord's Supper, and you're going to take that Lord's Supper worthily, you discern the Lord's body. You comprehend the Lord's body. You understand the Lord's body. And as you are taking taking care of your own personal body you are taking care of the body of Christ it says because of this look at verse 30 for this cause many in the Corinthian church many in the tongue speaking church many of the people that are bragging we have the gifts of the spirit in the Corinthian church for this cause many are weak and sickly among you and many sleep. Do you see there is sin there? And it's something they could have prevented. They could have prevented all the murmuring and all the bickering and all the division and all the disunity which they did not pre prevent. And because of that they were, even individually they were sickly. It says in verse 31, for if we will judge ourselves don't judge the church judge yourself. Don't judge your neighbors, judge yourself. Don't judge the other man there, the other woman there, judge yourself. If we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. I pray you will not be condemned with the world. You see, uh, the people bring unnecessary, uh, avoidable sickness upon themselves. I'm looking at Numbers chapter 12. Numbers chapter 12, uh, I'm reading from verses 1 and 2. Numbers chapter 12, uh, verses 1 and 2. And Miriam and Aaron speak against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom uh, he had married. For he had married an Ethiopian woman. And they said, as the Lord in this spoken only by Moses, as he not spoken also by us, and the Lord heard it. And the Lord heard it. Can you say that with me? And the Lord heard it. Lord heard it. Say that again. Come on here. Uh, you, you see what they are doing in the church now? You see that person there? You see this person there? Uh, don't, don't say I told you. I'm just, you know, we're friends. I'm just opening my heart to you that I'm not happy with this. I'm not happy with that. Uh, but don't tell them. Don't tell them. It is just between me and you. And the Lord heard it. Then you go to somebody who is not even a member of Deep Alive. And then you, you know, we were walking in the same office here. You look sorrowful, you look sad. Well, uh, let, let me tell you what's happening. In our church, it's not a member of the church. And then you report your church to that stranger. And then you say, but you know, I just told you so you'll be praying with me. No, you told him so you can unburden your heart. And so that you can open the wound. And so that you can, you know, tell them I'm an angel. And you know, they're not treating me like an angel. I am holy, holy, holier than everybody else. They're not treating me as special. That's why you're doing that. And Miriam and Aaron talking about uh, the marriage of Moses. Oh, wait a minute. Moses already got married before the Lord called him. And Moses already got married in the land of Midian. 
And when he was, he already had two children before the Lord called him. And God has looked at the marriage, and God approved of the marriage, and God approved of his family, and now he said, I'm sending you forth. They're talking about this. When Moses came to Egypt, he was remarried. And then when he performed all those miracles, the rod turned into a serpent, and then making the river Nile to become blood, and then opening the Red Sea, the man was already married. And Miriam at that time did not say anything. Aaron did not say anything. When Moses uh, prayed, and uh, you know, the manna came from heaven for the whole congregation, if the man was not right with God, how did manna come for three million people? He was already married, and now after more than 35 years they've been in the wilderness they were actually near the end of their lives so, you know, they almost spent 40 years together it's not they are complaining about you know the after all this Moses of all people and look at his marriage my marriage is better than his marriage what do you say to that my chill is better than his marriage and the Lord had it. You see, the church, we make ourselves sick because we are bringing these, uh, all these ideas. Look at it now from verse 3. Are you still there? Look at it. Now, the man, Moses, was very meek above all the men that were upon the face of the earth. And none of them saw that. The only, the only thing they saw was his marriage. And it says, And the Lord spake suddenly unto Moses and unto Aaron and, Mir and unto Miriam, Come out, ye three, unto the tabernacle of the congregation. And they three came out. And the Lord came down in the pillar of, uh, of the cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam and they both came forth. And he said, hear now my words, if there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision and will speak unto him in a dream. My servant, tell me the name. My servant Moses is not so. Who is, what's the word? And the, go on. Faithful in all my house. Ah, Aaron and Miriam, they were proving to be having a higher standard than God. Miriam and Aaron, they were proving to be holier than God. Greater than God. God said, this man Moses in my sight, I see through him. I see on the inside. I see on the outside. I see his transparent life and he is faithful in all my house. What are you complaining about? Heaven doesn't have any complaint about this Moses and God doesn't have any complaint about this Moses and you, holier than God and you, greater than God. You are the only one having a complaint against a man that is meek and perfect in my sight. It says in verse 8, will see him, will I speak mouth to mouth, even apparently and not in dark speeches and the similitude of the Lord shall he behold where, wherefore then were ye not afraid? Why then were ye not afraid? Look up here. The next time, uh, you know, your friend tells you, I say what I say. What if they hear? I'm not afraid of anybody. Ah, that's dangerous. A person that talks, I'm not afraid of anybody. A person that asks, I'm not afraid of anybody. This thing you are doing. If the leadership of the church will see this, you know, they might take a firm stand against you. You can even go and tell them and mention my name and tell them, I am the one that did that because I am not afraid of anybody. That's a backslider. The one that doesn't have any fear of God, any, any reverence for God, and he can just, you know, put his leg there, put his mouth there, and put his hand there, put, you know, just spoil everything everywhere. I'm not afraid of anybody. That's a backslider. That's why God said, Wherefore then were ye not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And verse 9, verse 9, everybody wants to say, go read. 
the anger of the Lord was kindled against them and departed. And the cloud departed from off the tabernacle. And behold, and behold, tell me out aloud. Miriam became leprous. That's avoidable sickness, avoidable plague, avoidable infirmity. That did not have to happen. Look at what Miriam had done uh, for Moses when Moses was a baby. And look at what Miriam had done as a woman leader that led all the women of Israel singing after they came out of the Red Sea. Look at what Miriam had done. A quiet, a meek a woman, a believing woman. Look at how she spoiled everything. I pray that your mouth will not ruin your ministry in Jesus' name. As she became leprous. We're looking at uh, a second, second Chronicles chapter 26. Second Chronicles chapter 26. And I'm reading here from verse 16. Second Chronicles chapter 26. And we're reading from verse uh, 16. Here is what the Lord is telling us in verse 16. It says, but when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. You see when uh, some believers you are in the lowly class there, in the lowly office there, in the lowly ministry there, in the regular ministry, house fellowship, in the regular ministry, zona leader, in the regular ministry, singing, in the regular ministry, you're doing something regular that everybody is doing. You are lowly of heart. But when he was strong, when he was promoted, when he had greater opportunities, when he had greater privileges in the, in the midst of the people of God, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. For he transgressed against the Lord his God and went into the temple of the Lord to burn incense upon the altar of incense. He was a king, he was not a priest. And so he kind of intruded into the priest's office. You know, uh, the, the ministry of the Word of God is well outlined in the Scriptures. As you come to the New Testament, the pastor, a man, I know other churches say, you know, lady pastor, you don't have that in New Testament. The pastor, a man, is the one in charge of the church. But there are some people that will say what a man can do, a woman can do. I don't think so. I don't think so. Because, you know, a man cannot be pregnant and, uh, you know, give birth to children. How many of you have, uh, you know, your father as the one that got uh, pregnant before you were born? Anybody there? You raise up your hand, I'll be praying for you. But you know, there are things women can do and women are supposed to do that that a man cannot do. And there are things that God has ordained that men will do and women will not do. You see, when we change those roles and we intrude into another person's ministry, what a man can do, a woman can do, we get into trouble unnecessarily. And so this man, a king, he wasn't a priest. He wanted to act like a real priest. And then look at verse 18. And they withstood Uzziah the king and said unto him, It appertaineth not unto thee, Uzziah to burn incense unto the Lord but the priests of the sons the sons of Aaron that are, that are cons consecrated to burn incense go out of the sanctuary for thou hast trespassed neither shall it be for thine honor from the Lord then Uzziah was raw, angry for you to tell me that uh, there's some people in the church, I, I think we're not reading our Bibles very well. If the pastor comes to correct you and challenge you, my brother, that's not right. Don't stay there. We get angry. How could he tell me that? He's a pastor. He should tell you. And if your husband happens to be a pastor, and you are the wife, and you are doing something in the church that he knows, ah, that's my area, I'm the pastor, I'm the one that should have done that. You can't discipline people. You can't just tell people, leave that choir. You are not the pastor. And if your husband will tell you, my dear, why did you do that? How could you do that? And then you become angry, it means you are backsliding. 
Because you see, there is orderliness in the church of the living God. And here it says, Hosea was wroth and had a censer in his hand to burn incense. And while he was wroth, while he was angry with the priest, the leprosy even rose up in his forehead before the priest in the house of the Lord from beside the incense altar. And, and Azariah, the chief priest, and all the priests looked upon him, and behold, he was leprous in his forehead, in his forehead. And they thrust him out from theirs, yea, himself, his church also, to go out because who smote him? I said who smote him? Because the Lord had smitten him. That's avoidable. That's avoidable. He didn't need to have that kind of leprosy near the time of his leaving the world. Look at it, verse 21. And Uzziah the king was a leper, tell me, until the day of his death we can avoid that. All those six that bring unnecessary calamity, unnecessary sickness upon us, just because we're not satisfied with the place God has given us. We want to occupy a higher place and play a higher role. It brings unnecessary problems. Jeremiah chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 25. Jeremiah chapter 5, and I'm reading here from verse 25. It says in verse 25, Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 25, it says, uh, here is it, your iniquities have turned away these things and your sins are withholding good things from you we're going to be healthy we're going to be strong we're going to have real backbone to stand in jesus name but we must avoid bringing all these calamities upon ourselves. Oh, say, okay, that's Old Testament. Let's look at the New Testament now. In John chapter 5, John chapter 5, I, read, I start reading from verse 9. John chapter 5, we look at verse 9, and immediately the man was made whole, like you are going to be made whole tonight. Sicknesses will vanish away. All the weaknesses will vanish away. And we're going to be strong and made whole in Jesus' name. It says, and immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. So far, so good. Look at verse 14. Verse 14, toward Jesus findeth him in the temple and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole. Tell me what follows say no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. You can bring sickness upon yourself by discrediting, not discerning the Lord's body, not understanding. This is the church of the living God. I want to push the church down, trample upon the church, scatter the church, and destroy the church. If you destroy his body, how can he heal your body? That means then he's telling us the same thing. See no more, lest a worse thing come upon thee. We're coming to point number two, the prescription for preservation from a sick body. The prescription, the prescription. Uh, what's the Lord telling also that you and I will keep healthy? I will keep healthy. I said I will keep healthy. Uh, you know, uh, some of these uh, people in the Old Testament, a uh, plague came upon the people of Israel. And many of them died. They died under the anger of God. You know, there are some people, especially, you know, as we're getting older, it is, uh, it's not the best time, even if somebody wants to be foolish, it's not the best time to be foolish. Because, you know, we're getting nearer and nearer, if not the second coming of the Lord, we're getting nearer our own time here on earth. And somebody is, uh, you know, all this time he's been in the church, and now that he's uh, getting nearer, departing from this world, is then he wants to fight the church. And he's not fighting, you know, an assembly in the world. He's fighting a church that is built on the Bible, built on the word of God. And because of that, a plague comes upon him. 
and they say, this is a plague that came upon you. You go to the doctors, they examine this and that. They say, you're right. But you see, I'm dying. There's something wrong. And they cannot see anything wrong. And somebody suggests, why don't you go to the pastor and uh, let him pray for you? No, I won't go to the pastor. I have some things I don't agree with in this church. And as long as, you know, that thing is not uh, put right to suit me, I'm not going to get to that pastor. Are you angry at the pastor? Well, if you say angry, yes, I am. Are you angry at the church? Well, if you say I'm angry, yes, I am. Because I don't like this. And the man is sick. And if you come to, for prayer, I'm going to ask you, how did this come upon you? How did you get to this? And if you are going to be healed, you'll be humble. Because it says, if my people who are called by my name, if they will humble themselves and turn from their wicked ways, seek my face and pray, I will hear from heaven. I will heal their land. I'll forgive their sin. And so, if you, if, when you're sick like that, and then medicine will not help, consultation will not help, operation will not help, there's something here. And instead of just going on in sin and in sin, if you died under that disagreement with the church, if you died under that disunity, where will you spend eternity? That's the reason why we don't need to bring any of these things upon ourselves. I'll be a holy Christian. I'll be a happy Christian. You know, I didn't come to the church because of, you know, churches, uh, principles, and administration. They put this down, they put this up, they appointed it. I didn't know all those people. They appointed me. When I came to the church, when I came, became born again, I was just born again and happy. Administration was not my problem. Calvary was my focus. And the fact that if I turn away from my sin and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, I'll be saved. And that's what I did. And salvation came. The joy of salvation came. Hold on to that. Especially as we're getting to the end of our lives here on earth. But if you want to, you, if you begin to worry about administration and, you know, selection. Uh, they put this one there. They put me down. This and that. You want to die murmuring. You want to die complaining. God will have mercy on us. Uh, look at this now. We're looking at uh, chapter 10, uh, chapter 10 of uh, 1 Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, look at what happened to them. Uh, it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, I'm reading from verse 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, uh, reading from verse, tell me the verse. Reading from verse 4, he is talking about the children of Israel and he's saying, uh, Look at this, and did all drink the same spiritual drink, uh, but they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with many of them, uh, God was not, was not well pleased for. They were overthrown in the wilderness. God was not happy with them because of that they died in the wilderness. When God was not happy with them, were they having good relationship with God? I said, were they having good relationship with God? Okay, but you know, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. He passed over them. But you know, they went through the sea, the Red Sea. And uh, you know, they came to, but you know, they sang praises unto God. Who is unto our God? And they ate the manna, and they drank the miracle water. And yet it says, after they had done all that, they got into all these minor, minor things about Moses, about Aaron, and Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, they raised up their own team also, and this and that, and it says God was not happy with them, pleased with them, and they were overthrown in the wilderness. If God is not well pleased with you, or the murmuring, or the disputes, or the questioning, or the tearing here and there, if God is not happy with you, and you die in that condition, our concern for you, my concern for you is eternity. Where do you spend eternity? What's your concern about church administration? What's your concern about, uh, you know, they put this one there, they put this one out there. What's your concern about that? How do you want to die? 
I want to die like a child of God. I said, I want to die like a child of God. Happy. Holy. You know, when you are not looking at position, you are happy. When you are not looking at, they didn't put my brother there, you are happy. When you are not thinking of, why didn't they put my wife there, you are happy. When did they, is that person better than my wife? Why did they put her there? If you are not thinking of that, you are happy. I pray you will be happy. Yeah. Who wants to be happy there? Your mouth will tell whether you will be happy or not. Your attitude will tell whether you will be happy or not. Thank God you will be happy. And then it says in verse 6 now, these things were our examples to the intent we should not lost after evil things as they also lusted, neither be ye idolaters as some of them were. And then it says, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and to drink and they rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication, never. God forbid. Somebody there say, God forbid. And some of them committed and fell in one day. How many? You know, as the Egyptians were going to, you know, the other side, these uh, 3,000, they met them also. They say, you? Were well, you not know, the people that left Egypt? Were well, you not know, the people that passed through the Red Sea? Were well, you not know, the people that were saved and redeemed? How is it? We're on the same side. I pray you'll not be on the same side with Satan. On the same side with unbelievers. When somebody, you know, is, becomes careless, is not thinking about his destiny, all he's thinking about now is, you know, grumbling, 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 you can end up on the other side. I pray it will not happen to you. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now, all these things happened unto them, for examples, and they are reaching for admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. I pray God will give us wisdom in Jesus name. I'm looking at 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 1 Corinthians chapter 13 we're reading from verse 1. 1 Corinthians 13 verse 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity I am become a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal you see the Corinthian believers all they were looking at now my charisma, my gift, my ability. Hey, I speak in tongues more than you. I speak in tongues more than you and your wife combined together. I have spiritual gift. And Paul the Apostle said, that doesn't take you away from perdition. Speaking in tongues. You can speak in tongues in the tongues of men and of angels. If you do not have the love of God in your heart to protect the body of Christ, to preserve the body of Christ, to respect the body of Christ, to reverence the body of Christ, and you just do here and there, and you're manifesting what you call charismatic gifts, you'll be lost. Look at verse 2. And though I have the gift of prophecy, and understand all mysteries, and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, and have not charity, I am nothing. you find that, you know, some of our people, they become wandering prodigals. They are wandering about. I hear they are casting out devils over there. I hear they are healing the sick over there. I hear they are moving mountains over there. I hear they are giving miracle children to people over there. And they don't look at, uh, you know, the pipes through which those things are coming. Over there, they don't understand salvation. They don't understand holiness. They don't understand anything pertaining to the character of the Christian. And I just do this. What's the source of such miracles? What's the sort of such things? It is better to die in the favor of God than to die outside the favor of God where they are laying occultic hands upon you because you want to be healed. The healing is over here. The deliverance is over here. 
and uh, you know, the, the people, I, I don't understand, uh, you know, what it is. Uh, many years ago, the, that man is no more here on earth now, so I can, you know, easily talk about that. Uh, we had started a deeper life, and, uh, you know, I happened to be lecturing that time at uh, the university over here, and the Christian people invited this person to uh, the Christian body there to come and preach. And because I was a lecturer there, and they knew me to be a Christian, deeper life had already started. They wanted me to sit on the platform with him. I said no, because I, I had a program I wanted to carry out after the, after the uh, meeting. They pleaded and pleaded and put pressure on me. I said, okay. So I sat down there. And the man preached and preached and preached and preached. It was, you know, very vocal and, you know, manifesting you know, this gift and that gift. I sat down quietly there watching him. And now he wanted to pray for the people. And he said, I'm going to pray for you. If I lay hands on you, you speak in tongues, power will come and this will come. The people were excited. I was sitting by his side. So he turned to me and he said, um, I want to, you, you can demonstrate it to these people. I want to lay hands on you so that when they see what happens over here on the platform, then they will surrender. I said, me, I said, never. And then he left the whole congregation was talking to, don't do like this. No. I said, no, I cannot allow you to lay hands on me. He said, I'm a man of God and the Lord chose me and the Lord anointed me when I lay hands. I said, I'm saying you will not tell me. Lay hands on me. And, uh, you know, when he was becoming embarrassed because, uh, you know, the uh, congregation, they were looking at us, and I stood my ground, he said, okay, okay, and then he started talking to the people, and then when he finished everything, I said, I want to see you privately. And uh, so he said, okay, and then I called him by the side. I said, actually, I wanted to see you at the end. That's why I didn't allow that thing. I said, I hear that you have illegitimate children outside your family. That you are not living right. You are not living straight according to the word of God. You know, he couldn't deny. He said, eh, because the church is not praying for me. That's why, you know, God has called me. I'm strong, but, you know, in times of my weakness and temptation, because the uh, church is not praying for me, that's why I fell into that. I said, why don't you take time apart? Instead of jumping from here to there. Since we know that you are not living right, stay and pray and say to your life, Instead of just, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. You see, there are people, they won't act like me. They will, because of the public, they'll say, okay, sis, he wants to lay hands on me. What kind of hand do you think he has? A person that is into sin. A person that is not faithful. And you cannot stand up straight and look, in, look at him, eyeball to eyeball, and say, no, you will not lay hands on me. And then, although it was like a show, a public thing, but I told him after the meeting, look at what we are hearing about you. And he couldn't deny it. That's the reason why we need to take our stand. I'm talking to people who are backbone. I'm talking to people who have conviction. And you are not going to say because of the office of so-and-so and because of the power, charisma of so-and-so, just bend low and not stand for the gospel. You will stand in Jesus' name. First Corinthians, First Corinthians chapter 13 verse 2. It says, and though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all the faith so that I could remove mountains, and I have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burnt, and have not charity, it profited me. Tell me, you can have the best title in our church. You can have the best opportunities in the church. You can even demonstrate it, and people are flocking to you. They are running from their district, they are running from their region, they are running from wherever, and they are running to you, but you know your life. It says, if I do all this, and I do not have the charity and the love of God, God is looking for, it says, I am nothing. And then it begins to say now in verse 4, charity suffers. Long, no complaint. Charity is kind, 
not cruel, charity envies not, no jealousy, charity vaunteth not itself, no pride, charity is not puffed up, no arrogance, does not behave itself unseemly, uh, no incorrect behavior, and seeketh not her own, is not self-centered, self-promoting, and is not, is, is not easily provoked, angry every time, uh, thinketh no evil, imagining evil, rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, who pays all things and endureth all things, charity never faileth. Your charity will not fail. You see, these things, if we don't take care of them, sickness may come. I pray the Lord will keep you healthy. And the Lord will keep you strong. And you know there are people that, uh, you know, they have all these uh, lopsided kind of behavior and yet they will not repent and they still keep on, I'm a worker, I'm a leader, I'm a preacher, I'm a pastor. Look at uh, first, Second Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 20. It says in verse 25, Fear lest when I come. This is Paul the Apostle talking to the people, uh, the Corinthians. Lest when I come, I shall find you such as not as I would, and that I shall be found of you such as ye would not, lest there be debates, envies, rods, strife, babitings, whispering, swellings, tumult. Corinthian church, speaking in tongues, but look at this debates and envying, manifesting gifts of faith. We can remove mountains, but they are strife, they are backbiting doctrinally sound they can put doctrine upon doctrine and everything appears all right but you see envies and wrath and strife back, backbiting whispering i'm telling you but don't let them hear don't say it came from me but you know i'm on the inside on the inner circle and i know what is happening between them there you know pastor so and so pastor so and so Pastor so and so and the wife for Pastor so and so, those I told you, I'm just telling you in confidence, all that kind of whispering and the swellings and tumults, lest when I come again, my God will humble me among you, and that I shall bewail many which have sinned already. And have not repented of the uncleanness and fornication and mischievousness which they have committed. Corinthian church, that's how those sicknesses came on them. And I pray that these sicknesses will not be upon us in Jesus' name. I say will not be upon you in particular in Jesus' name. See, the division is a great disease. Disharmony, that's a great disease. Disunity, discord. And dissensions, carnality, pride, envy, strife, contention, murmuring, bitterness, entanglements of the world, or restrained tongue, or ruly behavior. They bring disease, physical disease upon people. God will keep us free. Point number three, the priority and pursuit of a sound body. The priority and pursuit of a sound body. We're looking at uh, Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 2. It says, Fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, and being of one accord, and of one mind. It says, uh, don't look at position. This is my section. If anybody in my section is, you know, having a problem, I rush there. And that person, oh, that one is not in my section. Let his section look into that. If he's dying, well, they should take care of him. I have my own section to take care of. He says, no, this is the body of Christ. And we're all one. And we should remain one. And we're going to remain one in Jesus' name. For fear ye my joy. That she be like-minded, having the same love, 
being of one accord and of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife. Let nothing be done, tell me, through strife. There is something to be done. Look up here for a moment. Now we're going for the retreat. Have you heard? I said, have you heard? What's the date? 29th of March to the 1st of April. As we're going for the retreat, there are people, they're getting ready, they're, they're tightening their belt, and they're saying, I'm going there, and I'm going to be in the kitchen. Uh-uh, not again this time. Why? I don't want always to be in the kitchen. I must be there. If I don't get there, the food will not be ready in time. How do you know? With all these thousands of people that are going to walk in the kitchen, no, you've been walking there for too long a time. This time, you will not go to the kitchen. Somebody give me amen. Yeah. You will sit with the congregation. Why are you afraid of the word of God? Why are you afraid of sitting down and listening to the word of God so that all the rough edges of your life will be totally ironed out? I'm going to the kitchen, the kitchen. And then, if uh, we don't put them in the kitchen, all the people will put there. To prove that they cannot do it. We will pull something off. We will take something away. So that those new people in the kitchen will not succeed. And they will say, there we are. Now I told them, I told them that if I'm not there, the kitchen will not function well. But you know you're a backslider. You know you are the one causing that failure. You know, it's because you are striving. You are angry. They didn't put me there. And I must be at the kitchen. And all those who were in the kitchen last time, you will not be in the kitchen this time. Yeah. All those who are by force, by force, I must be in the kitchen. That attitude of by force disqualifies you. You are not going to be in the kitchen. And if you are a child of God, you will be happy in honor, preferring one another. You allow other people to go there. And if you are happy, they succeed. I'm happy you are succeeding. Yeah. Are you happy I'm succeeding? Yeah. Let Don't dodge. Let me see your face. You know, because somebody can say, yes, but... I said, are you happy I'm succeeding? Yeah. I'm happy you will succeed. Yeah. My success will be your success. Your success will be my success. That is the attitude of a child of God. No strife and no fighting. It says in verse 3, Let nothing be done through strife or being glory. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Let each esteem other Better than themselves. Look up here a moment. When we're to do something at the retreat. And this person is doing it. Well, I don't know what our church is becoming. What do you mean? Look at the people they put there. What do you mean? They can't do it. They don't know anything about that thing they put them there to do. What do you mean? If they put me there, Absalom. If they put me there, that's how they start. That's an Absalom. I will reorganize everything. Everything will be all right and perfect. Uh -uh. You have an ulterior motive. In honor, preferring one another. That's how we keep healthy in the church. That's how we keep happy in the church. I'm not jealous of you. I'm not jealous of me. He's not jealous of her. She's not jealous of him. And we do everything in the love of God. And this work will prosper in our hands together. Yeah. Verse 4, it says, Look not every man on his own things. But every man also on the things of others, how others will succeed. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Let the mind of Christ be in you. If the mind of Christ is in you, you'll be happy with everybody. Are you happy? You'll be happy with the church. Are you happy? 
you'll be happy with your local pastor and you're happy you'll be happy with your general superintendent and you're happy i said you're happy and then you will be as happy as the happiest person in the congregation. You will be as courageous or the most courageous in the congregation. You'll be as holy as the holiest in the congregation. You'll just, you'll just have a free mind. The Lord has chosen you and you're happy. They give you this to do or they give it to your brother, happy. Or they give this to you, they don't give it to your sister, happy. And your sister is uh, having a chance, you're not having the chance, happy. And that section is moving on our section they have not given us who are requesting for this amount of money this amount of money they say they are giving everything to kitchen they are giving everything to food and they don't give us okay when we get there if we don't have the money we are requesting we're going to show them even the whatever instruments we have we're going to play it in such a lousy way that when they come we'll say we told you we told you give us money for this and since the money did not come that's all we can produce we will not be like that. There will be love in this church. There will be unity in this church. And there will be the respect and the honor and the reverence we have for each other in this church in Jesus' name. When you are there to do your bid, we'll give you freedom. You'll be free to do the will of God. When I'm there to do my little bid, I'll be free to have uh, the freedom to do everything God has given me to do. You're free, I am free, she's free, and he is free. And we're doing the will of God. This work will prosper. Yeah. And your own private work will prosper. Yeah. And your private family will prosper. Yeah. And your own personal life will prosper. Yeah. Prosperity will flow everywhere in Jesus' name. Yeah. It's flowing to you. Yeah. I said it's flowing to you. Yeah. Are you there at the gallery? Yeah. It's flowing to you. Yeah. A new life from today. Yeah. A new overflowing of the blessings of God from today. Yeah. Every sickness in your body cancelled. Yeah. Every sickness in your family cancelled. And any discouragement or depression, disease in our church cancelled. From tonight, you are stronger. What are you? Rise up and tell the Lord from tonight. All those things of the past that brought uh, murmuring and grumbling and division and disunity. Everything is cancelled. Everything cancelled. And you are going to be more than a conqueror even from tonight in Jesus' name. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord. The Lord wants you to have this love one to another. And he wants you to live such a victorious life. No murmuring and no grumbling and no tearing apart and no discord and no discord. I mean, whatever you have done, if you have spoken something you shouldn't have spoken, you have gone the way you shouldn't have gone, why don't you call upon the Lord and say, Lord, here am I, here am I. I expose my heart. I expose my mind, expose everything to you and the strength of the Lord will flow through to you and the health of the Lord will flow through to you and the prosperity of the Lord will flow through to you and as you are helping, assisting for the church to be sound and strong and healthy you are also going to be sound and strong and healthy tell the Lord, tell the Lord, he'll make you strong